Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to First United Methodist Church. I am not Pastor Rick, and I've said this before, he wears that beard so much better than I ever could. But as a community of faith, I ask that you come together and maybe stand up and greet each other in the name of Jesus Christ. But don't roam too far, please. So please share Jesus' peace with each other. We do have a few announcements for this morning, so as I ask that you make your way back to your pews, I'll share those announcements with you. Family Promise, our next week to provide meals for Family Promise is July 21st to the 27th. You can sign up to provide a meal on the upstairs connection table. If you do sign up, provide a meal, please take a copy of the instructions beside the sign-up sheet. It just has things like current allergies and drop-off times. Again. Family Promise is July 21st to 27th, and I'm being flagged down from the uh, congregation. We are, uh, oh, what a blessing. So we are filled up for Family Promise. Thank you so much. And then one I'm sure everyone's favorite, Kitchen Cleaning Day is coming up. The hospitality team will be deep cleaning the kitchen on Wednesday, beginning at 9.30 a.m. They can use all the help they can get, so join them if you're able. They have jobs for all ability levels. Once again, that is Wednesday at 9.30 a.m. I'm going to ask that we now go to our Trinitarian Declaration um, and start the service, but before, as we do that, I'm going to step out a little bit. So I want to make sure we start this morning's service in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but I would be remiss if I did not observe the events that happened last night in Butler, Pennsylvania. An attempt was made on a presidential candidate, and it, it is required, basically, for all of us to examine ourselves and look at the place that violence does not have in society, and then to realize also that we should be a people of unity. As we're told in Proverbs 3.31, do not envy the violent or choose any of their ways. But we can counter that violence being reminded of what Paul tells us in Corinthians. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. As we work to understand, if we ever can, the evil that motivates these actions that we witnessed, let us turn to God as we specifically pray for unity in our country. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you seeking unity for our country. Bind us together in love and understanding. Help us to see beyond our differences and work towards common goals. May your peace reign in our hearts, guiding our actions and words. Let us be instruments of your love, fostering harmony and cooperation. We ask for wisdom from our leaders that they may govern with justice and compassion. Unite us, Lord, under your banner of love and truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And now let us center ourselves for worship.
Will you stand and join me in the call to worship? And good morning. presence of the Lord is in this place. This first song is one of my favorites. I want you to really listen and take to heart the words that you're singing, the summons.
Please be seated. Join me in the prayer of the day. Holy Lord, you have said that when two or more are gathered in your name, you will be present. We who gather welcome you and give thanks for your faithful presence. We exalt your power, goodness, and love. Renew our passion for holiness. Amen. From Psalm 32, oh, what joy for those whose sins are forgiven, whose mistakes are wiped away by God's grace and mercy. So let's rejoice in God's unfailing love, which has set us free again. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. No matter our circumstances, we are blessed beyond measure because of God's gift of Jesus Christ to us. Our ch this is our chance to give back with our time, our talents, and our money.
Gracious God, I dedicate these gifts to your kingdom work and my life to you as a living sacrifice, bringing all my actions on the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, come and fill your temple. Amen. ever-loving God, author of creation, what reassurance it is to know that all we need to do is knock. All we need to do is ask, and it is given unto us. Help us to make that our cry for the entire week, not only for the week, but for our lives, knowing that you are an eternal, everlasting, all-loving, infinite Father. We bring all of our joys and concerns to you this morning. We bring those listed in our bulletin. And we also bring those things that we have in our hearts that we are not sharing with our community of faith. As the author of creation, Father, you know all. You know those things that we keep to ourselves and choose not to share. Help us to have the courage, the strength, the ability to lay them at, the feet, at your feet, knowing that that is what you want of your children. We ask a blessing on this country. Help us bring unity to the entire country. To stay away from violence, we ask for a blessing on our church, our shepherd, Pastor Rick, our leaders, and our congregation in general. Help us to be your love with skin to all those people we encounter every single day. But more importantly, let us seek opportunities to serve others through which we also serve you. Help us to realize how grateful we should be for all that you have given us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
I could just close my eyes and listen to that over and over again. Beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful. Pray with me. Gracious God, we do not live on bread alone. Let your heavenly food of the scripture we are about to hear nourish us today in the ways of eternal life. Amen. The first scripture is Matthew 9, uh, verses 18 to 26. While he was saying these things to them, Suddenly, a leader of the synagogue came in and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. And Jesus got up and followed him with his disciples. Then suddenly, a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak. For she said to herself, If I only touch his cloak, I will be made well. Jesus turned, and seeing her, he said, Take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. When Jesus came to the leader's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, he said, Go away, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been, set, had been put outside, he went in, took her by the hand, and the girl got up. And the report of this spread throughout that district. And now from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 10 through 14. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. If you do not, then believe me because of the work themselves. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact, will do greater works than these, because I am going to my Father." I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. Just a little bit of humor to start this morning, and Jody, I promise I will stay in my box for those who are remote, because I'm a wanderer. This morning when I got here, I pride myself on trying to be prompt, and if any of you are the same, you're here at least 15 minutes ahead of time. For Dave, that's gotta be at least 30 minutes ahead of time. So I come in, I had a couple copies of my message, I'm ready to rock and roll, and as I walked in, I heard a couple folks saying, this is a very special day today. And I'm going, "Uh uh-oh, what didn't Pastor Rick tell me? And at the same time, someone said, the two pews up front are being reserved. And I'm going, oh, I might have a phone call to make here because I'm worried. It's not Pentecost. Definitely not Easter. It's not the beginning of Advent or Lent. What am I going to do here? Don't panic, Dave. Stay calm. And someone said, today is the global day of the chimpanzee. And I'm thinking, we're not bringing chimpanzees in here. And someone had the front two rows reserved specifically for something else that was going on. So um, thank you, God. So if there are any chimpanzees coming in outside, I, I, I apologize. And Marty, that's not saying anything for you, but I see where you're sitting. <laughs> We've all been there at one time or another, seemingly against the odds. Show of hands, how many folks have had something that was going really, really off the rails in recent memory? Things are going south really fast. You have tears of desperation strolling, streaming down your face. 
you have anxiety, you have fear, you have all those things going on in your body. Things are going to go south. And I need to refer to my notes because there's a really good children's book about this called The Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. Anyone ever had one of those? Maybe recently. But then have those tears of frustration and desperation turned into tears of elation and joy? Has that frown turned into a smile because of what you believe to have been a miracle? It's happened to us. And it can continually happen to us. And my goal this morning through my message is to talk about the miracles we heard this morning and the opportunities that we have to not only witness miracles, but be parts of miracles for others. Let us pray. Ever-loving God, help us to focus on you being the center of not only our universe, but of our lives. Having all things in control, knowing what we need, before we even need it, having influence on all things. Let us be ever mindful of your presence in our lives, every second of every moment, of every hour, of every day. Help us to realize that we are not only witnesses of miracles, but also part of miracles every day. We ask this as we ask all through your Son, our Lord, Jesus Christ. If I can't walk out there, I'll walk back here. I apologize for those of you who get dizzy watching me go back and forth. This morning's passage from Matthew is very intriguing, and I'd like to dissect it just a little bit so we can really look at each one of the lines that occurs. So Jesus is sitting, talking with disciples. But let's go back a little bit further in Matthew. What's happened earlier? Well, earlier on in the first part of this passage... People bring a paralyzed man to Jesus, and he heals the man. It's pretty neat. People are seeking Jesus out for healing. And then a little bit later, Jesus calls Matthew. Now, Matthew was a tax collector. And I don't know about you, but I just love filling out those checks every six months for the tax collector, right? We, we all enjoy that. First off, do I have any tax collectors here? Okay, because I got burnt in the first service. But I did offer to bring them to Burger King to buy them french fries, because that's all I can afford after you pay taxes. But tax collectors today and tax collectors back in the day, they weren't really people's favorites, were they? They're taking your money. They're taking your hard-earned money. So they're not really loved. So he says to Matthew, come on and follow me. And Matthew probably hesitantly says, you know what, I'll give this a shot. Could that have been a miracle in and of itself? Taking a person who is apparently dedicated to being a tax collector and saying, come on, follow me, and the person says, yeah, okay, I'll do it. Ask yourself, today's world, if someone came to me and said, come follow me, am I going to give up everything? I mean, we're talking everything. We're talking about your work, your livelihood, your family, you don't know where you're going to wind up or what you're going to wind up doing. People had Jesus gunning for them. I mean, this sounds like a really cool thing. Sign me up. But are we called every day to follow Jesus? Not necessarily to the extent Matthew was and the other apostles were, but are we called to follow Jesus? Yes, we are. So now we come up to the part where we hear our passage this morning and Jesus is sitting, apparently talking with folks, and a leader from the synagogue shows up, and his daughter had died. I cannot imagine the pain of having a child die. That is most likely a scar that never heals, and I apologize if I'm bringing it up to you and it has happened to you. But the point I want to illustrate is this man apparently heard of Jesus, and the man went to Jesus and says, my daughter has died, come. But there's one point that's easy to glance over in the passage. The man not only seeked Jesus, seek ye first, and asked Jesus, but he surrendered. He got on his knees and pled with Jesus to come for his daughter. 
And what does Jesus do? Gets up from sitting and starts heading toward the daughter. But he doesn't head alone. He's heading out with disciples. And he's probably heading out with a little bit of a crowd. And I'd like to imagine that crowd being composed of three specific groups of people. Those who are all in, all on board. I know who Jesus is. I'm following a thousand percent, no questions asked. Great. Those who weren't sold yet, who've seen other miracles, but were just on the cusp of maybe I'll follow him, maybe I won't, but I got to see this happen. And then there were others who were the true detractors, the ones who were against Jesus a thousand percent, no matter what he said, no matter what the prophecy said, no matter what he did. They were against him. And they were just looking for an opportunity to trip him up. And they are on their way with Jesus to this man's house. But then we hear another miracle happen. The woman who had the faith, who just wanted to touch Jesus' cloak because it would heal her. Anyone remember Tootsie Pops from years ago? You had that really tough outside, and then you had the neat tooth. It's kind of like that miracle. I call it the Oreo story, because you have a miracle going on out here, but then you have that miracle that occurs in the center. And I think it's an interesting dichotomy, because they almost contradict each other, but yet the miracle happens. Let me explain. The woman, by her faith, pursues Jesus and touches his cloak, and he says to her, by your faith you have been healed. How many of us do not feel that we are worthy to be in Jesus' presence? Maybe starting with the cloak is a way to go. Jesus does not want us to feel that way. Jesus wants to embrace us. Jesus wants us to embrace him. He wants that relationship with us. But this woman, in all the commotion that's going on, touches his cloak, and by her faith, she is healed. Then Jesus proceeds further with the group, and they come to the house. And we hear that there's a lot of flute playing and noise and clamor, and they're probably grieving. There's probably crying. There's probably all this bad stuff happening. And Jesus says to them, she's only asleep. And what did they do? They laughed at him. Did Jesus have every right to say, ye of little faith? Absolutely. But he didn't. They were dismissed. But I don't think they went too far away because I think they went, just like if there's an ambulance call in Muncie on Main Street at 3 a.m., everyone's out on their porch sweeping, right? What's going on? What's going on? They're probably staying at a safe distance, watching to see what happens going, wow, what's he going to do now? And he walks into the room, takes the girl's hand, and what happens? Wow. We heard an interesting word in that passage, though. We heard the word, she's only asleep. Those of you who know me know that I suffer from analysis by paralysis because that caused me a headache most of the week. And I so much wanted to send to Jody and say, I'm changing scriptures, I'm not good with this one. But it bothered me. Sleep, death, sleep, death. And it struck me, I was looking at it from a human perspective. For us, death is a period at the end of the sentence. Things don't go any further. Now, for a Christian, we believe that it goes further. And from Christ's perspective, looking back, that is sleep. So reassuring. That's the comma. That's the semicolon. It's not the end of the sentence. It's not the end of the story. Like Paul Harvey would always say, there's a rest of the story. And think about that rest of the story. Going back to the beginning of my message, no matter how bad things get, Jesus is with us. But what does it take? Well, we have the woman who went in faith. 
And we have the leader who I suppose went in desperation. Maybe some faith sprinkle in there, but desperation. But did the miracle happen regardless? Was the girl who was asleep awoken? Was the woman who was hemorrhaging for years healed? And I think that's interesting because we hear that story from Matthew and it shows two totally different perspectives, yet the same objective was met. How many times do we go to God in faith? How many times do we go to God in desperation? Each one of us is an individual and each one of us could answer that question differently. Does God still love us? Yes, he does. But really, the mind blower for me this week was the, if you ask these things of me. We heard this morning, ask and they will be given unto you. Wow, if we ask. Let me try something, Pastor Rick. Hey, God. I need $4 million to pay off the church and build something new. Didn't happen. Not unless those monkeys are coming in the driveway with the money. Let me try one more time. Ever-loving God, it is your servant, Dave, coming to you asking for $4 million. I fervently ask this in your name. Amen. Not yet. Why not? It's not his will. Am I being fervent? I don't mean to make a mockery of prayer, but did I go to God with a contrite heart saying, God, help me? Now fill in the blanks. I know I talked about $4 million for the church, which would be phenomenal. But at the same time, when we pray for even the smallest of things, are we truly reaching out in faith? Are we truly sharing our heart with God's heart, saying, help me through this, but let your will be done. Too many times, I think the miracles that in front of us, we do not see. For example, just this morning, I was reminded as I was sitting outside in the rocking chair, just watching life go by, how beautiful things are outside those windows. Why didn't I remember that? Because my back was to it. How many times do we turn our back to the miracles of life and just don't realize it? I mean, as I was sitting here or earlier, just looking out the window going, I never noticed that. But someone pointed it out to me. You see, someone had to show me the miracle of where I was. And sometimes that's all we need is a someone to show us where we are and that we're part of God's plan, and that there's a miracle there every day. I want to talk a little bit now about the miracles that occur every single day in our lives. And I want to use the five senses. And the story that I share is when my wife and I, some 30 plus years ago, were seeking to be married. We went to a United Methodist pastor, Pastor Paul Lockley, who has since gone on to life eternal. And he gave us the traditional, I don't know, 400 years of training ahead of, no. The traditional, I guess it was four months ahead of time of weekly get-togethers to talk about, are we ready for marriage? And a question he asked me, and I, to this day, will not forget my answer. He said, okay, Dave, is listening the same as hearing? And I, I threw my hand, absolutely, yes. If you look in the thesaurus, listening. And I see all the people go, no, 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 no. And he said to me, so as your new wife, if Susan says something to you and you heard her, were you necessarily listening to her? Guys, that comes back to bite me all the time. (laughs) You see, we can hear sounds, but are we listening to what's occurring? We hear stories. Are we actually paying attention to them? We hear the word of God, but are we listening to the word of God? I submit to you that when we listen to things, miracles are present. Just this morning, if you had one of those rainstorms that occurred and you heard the raindrops falling, 
You heard them, but were you listening? Did you realize what they represent? Did you realize, and this blows my mind, that God made such a world that we can exist, that we're just the right distance from the sun, maybe not the past week, but we have high tides that don't rise above their limits. We have rivers that stay where they're supposed to. We say animals that stay where they're supposed to. And when we listen, we hear what that really means to us. The raindrops might be a nuisance to some people, but if they're listening to what it means, it's a balance in nature. The sense of smell. Wow, I'm going to stay with that rain theme. Anyone ever smelled the air after a neat rain? When's the last time you took the time to smell a flower? That didn't happen by accident. That wasn't manufactured in a lab. The sense of smell is another opportunity for us to experience miracles every day. I go back to what I shared this morning, also with the sense of smell, the hot apple pie sitting cooling. How many want the apple pie now? Followed by the sense of taste. Wow, what God has given us in knowledge to put things together and to make foods and also experience those foods is phenomenal. Weiss Markets has apple pies on sale today. No, I'm not getting a commission. What about the sense of sight? We talked about hearing and listening. My question for all of us is, the sense of sight is seeing the same as witnessing. I read a statistic this morning, maybe yesterday, that the number of things that we see every day would take a pretty energized iPhone to process. But we see them every day, and we process them every day as best we can. But when we witness to them, when we see an act of mercy, when we see an act of kindness, when we see an act of love, a small miracle in itself, do we say, wow, that was neat? Or do we go, that was nice? Seeing another opportunity for those miracles in our lives. And the last sense I want to talk about is the sense of touch. Last week I had the opportunity to bring a message to a community of faith and I focused on the prodigal son, and we know how that story goes. But what was very humbling for me, and it really caught me off guard as I was sharing these words, is that the son realized he was in trouble. The son wanted to go home. The son had the speech ready in his mind. Father, I've sinned against you in heaven. Please take me back. Surrendering again, right? Please take me back. But as the father saw the son on the edge of the estate, the father ran to the son. Did the son get a chance to get any word out? And I know Pastor Rick talked about the prodigal son a couple of weeks ago. Did the son get a chance to get any words out? No. But the language of that embrace, wow, all was forgiven. I'm going to ask you to indulge me for the 10 seconds. I'd like you to close your eyes, and I would like you to imagine one of your best friends in the whole universe, one of your family members giving you an embrace. And let me know how that feels. Is that warm? Is that loving? Is that caring? Now keep your eyes closed, and I want you to replace that person with Jesus himself. You're not touching his cloak. You're not reaching for a hand. You are in the embrace of our Savior. Wow, isn't that neat? So you can open your eyes because I don't want you to go ahead and fall asleep on me right now. But I saw a really neat breakdown of the word faith. Standing for fully anticipate it to happen. F-A-I-T-H. When we pray, are we anticipating it to happen? Or are we, all right, well... I called the doctor, I called for a second opinion, I talked to the neighbor, I ghouled it. God, help me through this. I guess I did everything I could. Or are we on our knees, surrendering ourselves to God, saying, help me through this. I need a miracle. And also using the words, thy will be done. I would submit to you that there are a couple of reasons why we sometimes lack faith. But I'll take it from my perspective. 
because each one of us is on a different journey. First off, my favorite, distractions. Every Sunday morning at 9.30, I get a report that tells me how much time I spent on the phone the previous week. I know no one else gets any big reports, but I'm like, wow, that's a lot of time. But the distractions that we have in everyday life are not just limited to technology. What about family? What about things we let get in our way? I know one of my faults is the fact that I almost really enjoy playing devil's advocate to the point where I almost get in a fight over it. To what end? That's a distraction. Why do that? Why do that? The other reason I think that we do not have a lot of faith quite often is the fact that we're human. Are we made to be perfect? Does God expect perfection from us? No, he doesn't. But God expects us to be people who, when we stray, seek him out. Remember, he leaves the 99 to come for us. God wants to meet us where we're at. I remember once I was working with Pastor Doug Everly, and I was helping facilitate a confirmation class. And in the middle of the class, he just reaches over and taps me on the shoulder and says, sorry, Dave. Said, that, that's fine, Pastor Doug. And then he hits me a little bit harder, and he says, sorry, Dave. And I said, that's fine, Pastor Doug. And then he did it a third time, and in my mind, I'm going, you know, I could drop you if I wanted to. But he could probably run faster. I was like, what are we doing? And the kids are all starting to giggle. And Pastor Doug said, okay, class, what's going on here? I keep saying I'm sorry. But they said, you keep doing it. You've got to repent. You've got to try to not do it again. Oh, it makes sense. End of the class, he hit me one more time just to get the point across. So the distraction and the human nature. And also the other thing I want to share about faith is sometimes we don't think it's cool. How difficult is it to talk to someone else about the best thing ever? Well, if it was ice cream, you'd talk about it. If it was a sale down at Weiss Markets, you'd talk about it. If it was the monkey celebration in the parking lot at First United Methodist celebrating Global Monkey Day, you'd be all about it. But it's difficult to talk to others about Jesus because that's not cool. I know sometimes from a work perspective, there are legal ramifications from an HR perspective too. But we all know, and I know this is being recorded, there are ways around things. You can step outside and talk about it on one of your 15-minute breaks. But how difficult is it to talk to people about Jesus? I remember one ambulance call that I was on as an EMT, and there was this phenomenal save. Everything went just like that, and it was so cool. And the guy I was with said, look what we did. And I had a choice there to go, yeah, we did good. I said, now look what he did. Because you see, all the electricity that was used to resuscitate that person, all the oxygen, all the meds, we got that knowledge from somewhere. And it was God's will that people be there at that point in that time. And what was ironic about that is later on he said to me, who's he? And we had a really neat conversation. But do you see, each of us has that opportunity every day. We can share the gift of Jesus with everyone just by saying, let me tell you about my Jesus. Now, it might not be as easy as going up in aisle 14, again, the Weiss Markets, and now I don't get a commission saying, hey, lady, let me tell you about my Jesus. But if I start off by a smile, or if I start off by a, can I help you get that off the shelf, you might catch them for a surprise, because people aren't that nice sometimes. And it might lead into a conversation. Inviting someone to church, that's a difficult one. Because now you're not the cool neighbor, right? You're the guy who stops over for the campfire every other night. But when you say, come on over to my church, I want to show you something neat. We have an exceptional pastor who does a great job. And if you listen to his message, you're going to get something out of it. But more importantly, or equally important, you're going to become part of a family of faith. That's tough. But should we pray for that? Should we pray for those opportunities? Should we be like the people in that crowd when Jesus was going to heal, bring back to life the girl, and witness for that? 
We have it in us. We just have to have the faith that we do it. So my challenge for everyone this week, as you go forth from this place, is to look for everyday miracles. Through what you hear, through what you see, through what you taste, through what you feel, across the board. They're out there. They're out there in the pew right next to you. Each one of us is made in God's image. God's sitting right beside us. All we need to do is look and have faith. Amen. As a family of faith, let us go out into the world to love and serve God and each other as we look for God in ourselves and each other and work to be the instruments of everyday miracles. May the beauty of God be reflected in our eyes, the love of God be reflected in our hands, the wisdom of God be reflected in our words, and the knowledge of God flow from our hearts that all might see and in seeing believe. Amen.